Okay, we were talking about uh, you going to the state fairs with the Stooges, and you did uh, several weeks of those, right? The what? When you went on the road with the Stooges. Oh, yeah. What? And you did the state fairs. Now, this was what, what maybe in the late 50s? God, I can't Early remember. 60s, maybe? Late 50s, early 60s? So, so you did, uh, you went on the road with them for a while, I went on right? Eight weeks. And then you didn't want to get hit anymore because you were afraid you're gonna well, I was, get punch drunk, right? Well, no, when, when I was, when I was supposed to join Mo and Larry. Right. That's when I didn't I refused them. I see. But then uh, you did, did some of these state fairs, and then after you got done with that, what? what and I heard you were the what? The first comedian on television? Well, 1928. 1928. Wow, okay. There was a thing called television coming out then. Brand new, like radio, you know what I mean? Something new. So the only place that had a television station was Schenectady, New York. So I'm playing Albany, and they call me from my partners. I don't know why they did, but they call me alone to go up to that station in Schenectady and there's a little peachy box. You barely could get in it. And the sweat, you sweat like crazy. And they put all kinds of makeup on you so it, it would you look normal, you know. And I, I did that show and uh, it was before Burl came in. Burl came in later. I was the first one, first comedian that played television in that, in that year. 1928. Mm -hmm. Wow. What did you do? Your act? I did some stuff around the piano. Uh huh. The little teacher piano they put in there. How they got it in there, I don't know. <laughs> did they pay you? No. <laughs> no pay. Just to do Experiment. it. Experiment. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so let's let's uh, let's hear this story. What is this about this this monkey or oh. chimpanzee? What was the story? Tell me that. In the crazy club in Chicago. We stayed there 18 weeks at the Apollo Theater. In the act, there was a guy by the name of Dr. Backerstall who had this monkey, John Mendy Jr. It was a chimpanzee. And you tell him what to do, and they do funny stuff, you know what I mean? But he, uh, Ted Healy had him from Dr. Backerstall. Backerstall owned the monkey. So, um, First of all, Ted Healy and the monkey didn't get along at all. <laughs> they made it, they hated each other. <laughs> so uh, Ted would come out there and he'd tell the monkey to do something, and the monkey did something the opposite. He says, jump. And the monkey wouldn't jump. Healy said, a little higher. <laughs> he didn't jump, and then the lights would go out, and he says, and goes up and says, you should have seen that jumping monkey jump. <laughs> Nobody was, but then they do things with monkey. Got a lot of laughs on the monkey. And before you know it, Ted was, had enough trouble with the monkey. So uh, he said to the audience, I'm the king of the beast, not you, to the monkey. And he hit the monkey. He did. He was so drunk, he hit the monkey. Monkey went out of and uh, that one, uh, that uh, Dr. Backerstall was a, at this time it happened. Ted Healy called Jack Marcus, who was Ted Healy's manager from Chicago, and he came out by automobile with a cage, with a monkey cage. And after the show was way over at night, we uh. Ted Healy says, we've got to go down and steal that monkey because Jack Marcus will be here any minute. We're going to put the monkey in the cage and that'll be it. Not knowing that Dr. Backerstall got wind of it, it was across the street and saw the thing happen with the monkey. So he got the monkey and set it off and for the next night, when we went on the stage at night, Plain clothesmen came back, must have been six of them. They went after Ted and the three of us for stealing the monkey because Buck the Vacker stall filed a suit 
against Ted. So they, so they stand in the wings while we did the show at night, so he wouldn't escape. And Wolf got away. He, I don't know how he got out, but he got away from the, from the, uh, his officers, and they were plain clothesmen. So we went down, we went down to the jail with Ted, and maybe we were in the jail and everything. A couple hours later, Wolf walks says, "I confess, I'll tell, <laughs> I'll tell everything," <laughs> and they put him in there. And uh, before you know it, we had to go to court. We stayed in jail eight or ten hours before Ted got us out and himself. So we went, we went, had to go to court. It looked pretty bad for a while because the state's attorney was pretty sharp, you know, and he had, he had made it in. He made Dr. Backerstall had a lot of trouble for Ted, but, but we got out of it. Looked pretty bad for a while. For attempted stealing of the monkey? Yeah. <laughs> what were you going to do with the monkey, with the chimp? He, well, he, he took them. Jack Marcus took the monkey and t t took him to some zoo. I don't know where. Oh. Oh, you, he did steal the monkey. Oh, yeah. Oh, jeez. We stole the monkey. Looked pretty bad for a while. Mm hmm. But, you know, Ted got us off on. She Ted was a very big favorite in Chicago. He was one of the big, big draws in, in, in those days for musical comedy stars. He was a big, so he got off pretty much. I, I know it cost him something. Yeah. Now, um, you worked in the Catskills. Did you go out, out on your own, doing your own act? I do by, by, by yourself? Work, working by myself. Uh-huh. Did you find that easier? Oh, yeah. Very nice. I worked gross and guns. And all the different, I can't remember the names, but I mean, they were great. I worked at one place where Danny Kay was there. Uh, he was a social director. A social director? Yeah. Danny Kay? Mm hmm. Oh. He's quite a star, you know that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He was quite an artist. Did you uh, just stay at that one hotel and do a show every oh, night? No, all different. No, I, 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 I went up about two or three years, different places. Uh, and on the weekend, I work about six different places. Wow. You stay in one place where you, you know, get your meals and everything. You come back, they take you to an automobile to the different different uh, places up the Catskills. Mm -hmm. Pretty and good I, food there, huh? I tell you, kind of a good friend of mine <laughs> was Milton Burrow. Uh-huh. Very close. He got, he softened up, he got mellowed. And uh, Danny Thomas was a nice man. I made a picture with them, with Danny Thomas, Sid Caesar, and Milton Burrow in a show called uh, Side by Side. CBS special of the week. It was a good one. I had a good part, and Milton Burrow got me in it. I see. Now nice. he was, now he was known for s supposedly stealing jokes. Was that true? It's true, but I seen him when he go out there by himself and and, and did his own stuff it was great. But uh, uh, he was such a uh, admirer of Ted Healy. Ted Healy was his idol. So Milton Berle, in those days, had his mother in the audience laughing at his jokes, applauding, and became a big thing. Milton Berle and his mother, you know, all the time. So. It got got a big thing, so I'm walking down Broadway, I'm with Ted, and Milton Burrow's coming this way. We're going that way. And he just stops Burrow and says, Hiya, Milton. He says, If you're laying off next week, I'd like to use your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Ted Healy. Now, what was the story uh, that you said you didn't think maybe you could tell? Huh? What was the story you, uh, you said that you didn't think you could tell just a few oh. minutes ago? Why don't you tell me that? Because you can tell me anything. A little bit off. Can I do it? Sure. Well, we're working in the Palace, New York, with Ted, and he always went around looking for characters. You know what I mean? So down in Greenwich was a, a female impersonator dressed up funny with women's clothes, and it was a comedian named Lovebell Rose. So Ted got a big kick out of him, 
and they took him up to New York to work in the palace. And you gotta be, you know, in those days you can't say hell or damn. Everything had to be clean and class. So went out there and LaBelle was on the stage doing doing his bit, dressed up like a female personator, and he was. And and he's doing everything. And Healy comes out and says, I enjoyed you very much. I want to tell you something. I understand that you like all kinds of birds. And LaBelle Rose said, I just love them. Oh, I just, I just adore them. Healy said, did you ever kiss a parrot? No, he says, no, but I've kissed a cockatoo. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that, that was, that was, and we almost got canceled, for God's sake. Really? Well, kind of that joke. I never heard a laugh in my life like that. Was, I never heard a laugh like that. That was Ted Healy's humor. Mm -hmm. Funny, right? Yeah. So, um, where did you play uh, when you were out on your own? You were at the Catskills. Oh, when I, uh, when, when, at, uh, well, I rejoined Ted Healy again in 1935 or, no, 36, when he was, when he was already established as a movie actor with NBC, it was CB, MGM, you know, when the Three Stooges left him, went with Columbia. Well, he wanted me, and Hagen's was out there, and it was, Wolf couldn't work anymore because he was too sick back in Washington, D.C. And, I, and that uh, we got a guy named Sammy, Sammy Wolf, whose name was Sammy Glasser. So I'm kind of being God of Wolf and Hagen's, so he changed his name. He had a, went down to the downtown had his name changed to Wolf, which right. he did. And we went with Ted for a while, but it was no use because the three guys made it big, you know. Mm -hmm. You had no chance. So um, we went back, we went, we went on the road for a while, and with the three of us, we did all right, you know, not great, not like the original Wolf. But originally I came back and started doing the single at the piano. Uh -huh. And that, that, I worked a lot in New York. I worked at Palace by myself. I worked a lot of the big theaters by myself, and I was doing pretty good as an act alone. Mm -hmm. If Wolf would have been alive, I'd have done it with him because I, I liked him so much. And we worked together so great. The original Wolf. Right. That we, and I, I played all the big theaters. And, and, and uh, all the best nightclubs, with, with the big bands and everything, oh man. Did you work it down in Miami in the 50s and 60s? I worked in Miami in the 40s, in 46. And um, there was a guy named Willie Weber, who was an agent then. He was a racket man, but he knew all the nightclubs, owners, and he became such a well-known agent, I mean, he left his racket and became an agent and did damn good as an agent. He, can I tell you some of the people he handled? Huh? Jackie Gleason, Mickey Shaughnessy, Phil... Harris? Hmm? Phil no, Harris? Phil Harris. Phil somebody. Silvers? Huh? Phil Silvers? No, no. I knew Phil very well. Oh, did you? Huh? I always liked Phil Silvers. Oh, sure. He was great. Nice guy. And, um... Hey, this guy Phil Foster. Oh, Phil Foster, right. I knew Phil Foster. Oh, yeah. All those kind of guys. He had worked at him, and he had some stable. And he took me on. He kept me. So he booked me down in Florida at Kitty Davis's. What was that? I don't know what that 1946. is. 1946. Uh-huh. And... What was Kitty Davis's? Is that the name of the place? Gorgeous little club in Miami Beach. Uh-huh. Gorgeous club. And I went in there and went on. I was getting about 400 a week in those days, which wasn't bad. And 
I went down there and I hit so big, I stayed 22 weeks. Pretty good at it. Right. Then I became very, very well known in that part of the town. I came back at a dice raise. A couple of months later, I stayed eight more weeks. That was that was my club. I loved it so much. Was the act still about 15 to 20 minutes long? Oh, I did about half an hour. About half an hour? I see. Boy, what a club that was to work. Hmm, so great. Well, let's move up to like the 50s and 60s then. I mean, you've been making a living for all this time still performing, right? Yeah. Where did you work in the, say, the 60s, in the 1960s? Oh, uh, I'm in California, and there's a friend of mine named Buddy Lewis. He said, Bouncy, you always keep talking about Paul Benson and Hugh Benson. And Hugh Benson and Paul Benson Hugh was the youngest brother of the two of them. And Hugh, Paul was a big, uh, what do you call those guys, publicity man in New York, one of the biggest. And his younger brother was Hugh, who uh, was a very good friend of mine through Paul. And we became very close. And before you know it, when I'm in California, well, uh, Buddy Lewis picks up a trade, the trades, the variety of something, and it's about Hugh Benson. He's, and he says, Mousy, you always talking about you, uh, about you and Paul. Is this, the, is this the Hugh Benson that you know? He says, I have no idea. And Hugh Benson became a, in the publicity, but he was such a big publicity man for Warners that they made him assistant executive producer of all television. You bet. I didn't know this. So I said, he said, well, well, why don't you find out? I said, all right, I'll take a chance. So I got in my car, went out to the Warner Brothers. I met you, Ben, and it was him. He says, shake hands. He says, you're working Monday. I said, what? I went in a, I went in a, in a thing called Guatemala City. It was a thing called Guatemala City, and the name of the show was Maverick with James Garner. Right. And I did a scene with James Garner, James Garner and Marcy Garner. <laughs> I did a scene with him, nice man. And then uh, after I did that, uh, Hugh calls me, he says, there's a 77 such set trip doing, but it's all about a comedy waiter. We're, we're deciding, we're trying to decide whether we use, use a comedy waiter or go, you get a straight waiter. You know what I mean? So I went home and they called me and said, we're going to do, we're going to go with the comedy waiter. So I did the comedy waiter, came out good, and then after that, after I got through making it, uh, I called up my friend Jad Paul, who's the banjo player with Spike Jones, the greatest I ever heard in my life, the greatest banjo player. So we teamed up for club dates. And we went on the club dates for about four weeks. Played at Palm Springs. And while down Palm Springs, the, uh, the thing I did was 77 was on. And I saw it. I looked pretty good. And after we got the, the wind up, Benson didn't know where I was. So when we got through with the wind up, doing the shows, we went back to Hollywood, and then the hotel I was living, apartment hotel, I forgot the name of it, and in my box was a message. 
of Hugh Benson. He says, come out here quick. I'm trying to get a hold of you. Come out here right away. And I went out there right away. He says, we liked you so much in Sunset. You're going in our new series called Ga uh, 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 Surfside Six? Surfside Six. Right. And I went on that. And you played a regular on that, right? Semi-regular. Uh, Semi-regular? I did every other one. Uh-huh. Well, that was a lot back then because they did a lot of shows in a year, did didn't you they? see it? Uh, no, I haven't seen it, but I saw the picture of you. Oh, I did. You played a what, professor? Two, two years of it. Uh-huh. And the reason it didn't run any longer because it was too much of a takeoff on Sunset Strip. Uh-huh. Just the same idea. And 1777 was a big hit. So, and, so you worked... Uh, you got a lot of acting work then out of oh, that. Oh, I did acting work, uh -huh. comedy. I, I did what I did in, in, in 77 Sunset. I did a comedy work. Uh -huh. very, very good material. You know, they wrote everything and, they, and do what they tell you. But tell me a little bit about Spike Jones. Spike was a nice man, a brilliant. I call him a genius. Did you ever, did you ever see his stuff? Yes. Did you enjoy it? Oh, yes. Very nice. So, uh, in my hometown, Washington, D.C., I happened to be home for a few days. You know, every time I, 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 I have a job and it's up, I come back to Washington with my mother and father, you know, stay at the house. And I have a clear sky. Spike Jones is playing some big club there, big place. And he's got his band up there, Spike Jones and his City Slickers. So um, I happened to go up there to see the show, and the banjo player, Freddie Morgan, who was on the bill with me when I worked with Garner Open Hagen's, he was the banjo. He did a banjo act with his partner, two banjos. Uh, it's called Morgan and Stone. So um, I came friendly with him again. Before he notices, now see, the guy who's doing, his name is uh, Sir Frederick Gass, is leaving the show because he's got a job offered him back in California with one of the, to do cartoons, you know, very big. So he's going, and he's got to be replaced. So he arranged an audition for me in front of Spike Jones to do my stuff. She was, I would fit in. So uh, I did it for Spike, and he liked it. And it went to my head a little bit, you know, and he wants me. So he says, oh, you, as soon as, uh, as, uh, as Sir, Sir Frederick Gass is finished, we want you to come in, and I'll, I'll definitely get in touch with you. And he got my address, phone number, and everything. And before you know it, he says, how much you want? And I told him I, 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 I had a big price. He says, how much? I told him so-and-so. He says, you take the stick and leave the band. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that got a laugh. That's his sense of humor. Very good guy. Come up with funny. He had one guy that he paid just to write song titles for him. Just to write the titles? Just the song titles, and Spike would say, we're going to play a song written by Rogers and Hart. Roy Rogers and William S. Hart. <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. Then he said, we're going to do a song entitled, If This Isn't Love, You'll Have to Wait Till I Get a Couple Hours Sleep. You know, <laughs> things like that, you know. And oh, every night was different. And wh what kind of places did you play with them? You name them. He played the best. Not the littlest, the best, because he broke the record in Vegas at that time. What hotel was that? Riviera. At the Riviera? Did he pack them in? Was that a couple hour show? Huh? That was probably like a two hour show? Two hours and ten minutes. Mm-hmm. And um, he, there's like Henry Youngman, to me, was one of the nicest guys. And one of the funniest men, remember Henry Youngman? Oh, yeah. So um, I'm, 
I'm following him in, in a club in Washington, D.C. called the Cairo Club, very classy club, but he didn't do any business in, in that week. And there was nobody, and the show I caught, his last show I caught, because I'm going in next. I, I open the next day, and nobody out there. It must have been two people. So he goes out and says, he was mad too. He says, I'm doing a hell of a business and I'm packing them out. <laughs> packing them out. Did, did, you, uh, did you ever work with Red Skelton? I always say this, but he's one of the nicest men I have had the pleasure of meeting and working with. What because kind of stuff did you do with him? I did 40 different shows with him. At C uh, the television at shows? Huh? The television shows? 40 of them. Doing bit parts on the show? I used to help him out too. Uh, like one particular show, he's, he, he goes out ahead of the show and warms him up. He did himself. So he says, Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm running out of material. <clears throat> Mousy, you got anything you know? I says, here's a bit you did in Vaudeville when you were on the bill with us. And I told him the bit and he did it. And he, he, walk, he walked out and he comes out and talks to the audience and he's got a string. You know, one of these big strings? Uh huh. And he goes out and goes around the audience with the string, and they all, all, all of them hold it, holding the string. And he comes back on the stage and says, I want to see how many suckers I can get on the string. <laughs> That's a joke again. Get a big laugh. <laughs> I used to give him a lot of jokes. I hear, I hear he used to do a, a, when he would rehearse in the afternoons, I always call that the dirty hour. Was he dirty? <laughs> But when he, but when he got, when the show, when the camera went on, cleanest man in show business. But he let it all out during the rehearsal, though, huh? Do rehearsal, oh Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> woo. Um, Funny. What about Jackie Gleason? Did you work with Jackie Gleason? Yeah, I worked about on Dumont. What was Dumont? The Dumont. CBS. Ne yes. I did six of them. With him. Six of the honeymooner shows. No. Or his variety show. Uh, a variety show. Right. Like uh, Reginald Van Gleeson, all, all the other stuff. I did six of them. You did a lot of the, the what, bit parts and stuff on the. A lot of, a lot yeah. of junk. I see. Yeah, bit parts. He was nice. I liked him. He was a clever man. He didn't like to rehearse, I hear. Not too much. <laughs> but he was clever, though, wasn't he? Mm, yes. Yes. Do you, uh, you still play the piano? I used to play a little bit. You, you used to play a little bit? You don't play anymore? I haven't touched it much. No, really? I, played, I used to play good. Yeah. I was a good musician. Well, do you think there's anything else uh, that we might want to talk about that we've left out? I'm not running out. My mind's running out. <laughs> All right. You were never married, were you? Huh? Were you ever married? Never got married. Wasted. Oh, yeah? Are you married? Yes. That's good. So Are you're... Happily, happily married? Yes. That makes me feel good. Really mean it. <laughs> I feel good about that. Yeah. Thank God. So you've pretty pretty much been married to show business all these years, huh? I went with six. I almost got married six different times. I backed out. Just no good. I'm sorry I didn't. There's one girl I particularly wanted to marry, but I didn't do it. So. That would be great. Okay. Won't you come? 
come home, Blue Bailey, come home. She cried the whole night long. Do your cooking, honey, pay the rent. I know I've done you. <laughs> oh, I'm getting away with murder, I'll tell you that right now. Blue Bailey, come home. She tried the whole night long. I'm on the plane. Goddamn shame. Blue Bailey, where the hell are you? Somewhere. I was walking down Broadway the other day. The guy up to me says, Stick him up. I said, Stick what up? He says, Don't confuse me. It's my first job. <laughs> Bill Bailey, come on. I took a bus in Los Angeles to San Francisco. Stopped every tree, every pillar, every post. I didn't know it was a greyhound. Bill Bailey, the jokes are over. I gotta get the hell out of here while I'm safe. Whatever it was. <laughs> You don't remember any of those old parody songs, do you? I those see songs it. you used to play? I used to do a thing called Very Embarrassing. I used to take falls, I said, Very Embarrassing. Another fall, Very Embarrassing. On well, my fifth falls, it's very monotonous, you know, where it is. <laughs> Switched on the TV. All the lights went on with a hell of a lure. All my friends are surprised. Happy birthday to you. Very embarrassing. I once saw a mermaid as cute as can be. No one. Uh, last night I went home late. Oh, oh. While getting a manicure, I asked for a date. I said, let's have cocktails and dinner at eight. I said, while we're dancing, I'll make love to you. She said, ask my husband, cause he's shaving you. Very embarrassing. I once saw a mermaid as cute as could be. From under the water, she beckoned to me. She said, you may kiss me, if that is your wish. I did, she was different, the top half was fish. Very embarrassing. Oh, <laughs> but that's great. Here's a great one. Right. I can't get through the That's okay. I arthritis. I know. In this modern era of psychology, biology, and sex, language has a brand new terminology, terrifically complex. In my dictionary, I've applied myself in vain. What's this new psychosis? that has smitten me. The words as the door have turned and bitten me. Bring back the good old days when the wish was just a yen and the violets came with boyfriends and the women went with men. I can remember when a bloom was just a garment and a strudel and after dinner dish. When a bro was no one's daughter, just a trip across the water and a sucker an ordinary fish. Bring back the good old days, will they ever be the same? When a pansy was a flower and a fanny was a name. <laughs> That's great. You, you know you know who did that? No. Georgie Jessel. Oh really? My who's one of my favorites. It is, it is Georgie Jessel. That was in Georgie like Jessel, it's certainly nice to sound like him. Well, I just did impressions. <laughs> nice man, love him. Was he nice? He mostly made his uh Fame from doing uh, um, telephone bit. Oh, really? With his mother. Oh. Fun as hell. He had, he had, his timing was so great. May I get back to my stall? Sure, <laughs> sure. And, and, and we're talking about now where you went out with Joe Dorita and Frank Mitchell. And Frank Mitchell. From Mitchell and Durant. Oh, I see. So, uh, who uh, who played the Larry part, kind of? Um, I did. Oh, you did. And 
Joe Dorita played Curly. I see. And Frank Mitchell did Mo. Oh, I see. So, uh, what kind of places did you work there? Worked at a big, big fairgrounds in Boston. Uh huh. Uh, Rhode Island. Big uh, in Chicago. A couple of weeks there, and Iowa. Were you hitting each other and stuff still? Doing all the shit. So I guess you got over your fear of getting punch, punch, punchy from it, huh? Back then, I used to do it. Here's the kind of jokes I did with, with them. All right, I'd like to hear that. Uh, hey, Mousy, who's that beautiful broad you're going out with? I said, she's not only beautiful, I love her so much, I thought I'd take on a trip, trip up to Maine. He says, to Portugal? I says, no, to Bangor. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff we did. Right. <laughs> and it worked out. Uh huh. With the bang in the head and all the stuff. Do you, do you still perform? I haven't performed in, oh, at least two or three years. Two or three years? What was the last show you did? Well, no, recently. Okay. What was that show, Tom? I did a show for uh, uh, Tom. Yes. What was that show we did out? Did out with Gary Young. Oh, uh, for the uh, uh, Independent Writers Association in Culver City is Crossman MGM. I did it. I sat down in the audience. They were like interviewed, and I. They asked me questions, uh -huh. and they said, "What are some questions?" I says, "Well, I went on the on the uh, interview uh, on uh, in Philadelphia on the I uh, know on the Stooge Convention. Really true. I went uh -huh. on several of them. So uh, while well, I'm there, and the uh, who was there was Mo's sister, Mo's daughter." Mo's son, so he's sitting down doing autographs, you know, signing pictures and all that stuff, mm -hmm. like we did at Beverly Gardens, you know. So, uh, Paul Young, Paul uh, 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 Howard puts down an autograph, so and so and so and so, best wishes, so forth. Paul Howard, son of Mo Howard, you know. So I look at this, and I'm signing next. So and so and so and so, best wishes. Mousy Garner, the son of James Garner. <laughs> <laughs> I got a kick out of that. Put your yeah, hand just up put your hand up there, here. and I'll Jack shoot it. The center. There you go. Could you lean it for? Okay, that's good. The plaque that uh, they presented. Okay, this is the plaque that was presented to a Mousy at Princeton University. At Princeton University. And it says, Lifetime Achievement Award, National Comedy Hall of Fame, January 7th, 2002, for sharing his humor and bestowing upon us the greatest gift of all, laughter. Mr. Mousy Garner. Well, that's, a, that's quite an honor there, Mousy. All right. Well, thank you for letting me uh, sit. And, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. That's fine. Well, thanks for letting me talk to you, Mousy. This well, is something I've sure. wanted to do. And... Uh, Thanks yeah, for listening. Sure. Uh, you got anything else, maybe? Uh, All I can say is a pleasure that, that you came over and hope to see a lot of you. Well, I hope to see a lot of you, too. Thank Mousy. you very much. And uh, keep up the good work. All right. You, too. Thank you very much.